afternoon. Don and I are here again on a rainy Sunday afternoon. And we got uh, sort of getting on toward the end of the tourist season. I've already bagged my and bagged and tagged my allotment of tourists, so I can't get any more. You know, I get a few smiles from my my Uber riders when I say that. They seem to understand, especially the natives. You know, they they know what I mean. And I had a couple of natives from. Uh, uh, let's see, was it uh, Peaks Island? And they said, "You sure you can't get any more?" You know, because it's elbows to elbows. Uh, you know, it tore us up on their Peaks Island. During, they said there's three or four hundred uh, people. Uh, you know, during the winter, and uh, five to seven thousand during during the win during the summer. And they're just, they're just sick of it. You know, <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's the way things are up here. Population in Maine uh, doubles or triples during the during the summer. Depending on where you are, you know. But anyway, I got uh, something I, I think it might be special for you, because uh, oh, seven, eight, nine years ago, I was uh, browsing through a flea market up there in uh, Ogunquit, and I came across uh, an antique book right here. It's uh, up in Maine by Holman F. Day. It's an anthology of honest goodness Maine poetry. I don't know what you think about poetry, but I, I think it's it's uh it's boiled down words let me make the analogy of what i mean is uh you take maple sap you know when i was a kid out in dixfield there was a maple tree out in front of my house and i used to like to climb that thing and there's a big old branch that had a, a a knot that was on top of the big branch that had made a a, a hole you know the, the way that the branch had grown up around the knot so that there was a little well inside of that knot where the the maple sap would well up inside uh, the knot hole. And I could dip my finger in there and you know, you'd taste it and it's a sweet, sweet sap, it's just maple sap, very watery. And it was, you could taste it sweet, sort of like words are sweet. But if you take that sap, the way they do here in, in Maine and Vermont and other regions, Canada, and you boil it down it takes a long process. You know, you boil it down to 30 to 35 to 1, the way they do it. I think that's the ratio. You get maple syrup, and you get the essence of what that maple sap is, and you get maple syrup. And that's sort of what poetry is. You take, take away all the stuff that it isn't, and you get down to what it really is. And that's, that's sort of what the, my definition of what poetry is. And it's just the raw essence of, of it. And sometimes a little... Uh, too concentrated, too sweet. It's kind of hard to, to take full force, if you will. And that's what some of this poetry is, because uh, this is from uh, uh, from the 1900s, uh, and this is old Maine. This is really the old stuff. Uh, my my version of this book was uh, from a, a, uh, the reprinting from 1913, and it says down here in the, the flyer. That it, uh, there were 500 copies that were printed in 1913, and I've got one of them. I feel pretty privileged. And uh, he dedicated it, uh, Holman F. Day. He says, To my friend and fellow in the craft of letters, Winfield H. Uh, M. Thomas, Thompson, uh, i got to get this right, Winfield M. Thompson, to whom I am indebted for more than one of the stories told herein, this volume is dedicated. And uh, so I don't know who Winfield M. Thomas was, but. Uh, he did it. And uh, Holman F. Day had a preface to his book uh, in the form of a poem. And uh, here it is. It's just a short one. And uh, we'll get on to the one that I want to really give you. Yeah. But this is the preface. And I'll try to read it in the right way. Uh, I think in the way that Holman F. Day intended it. Here you go. I don't know how to weave a randelay. I couldn't voice a sigh and song of love. No mellow, mellow lyre that on which I play, I plunk a strident lute without a glove. The rhyme that is strunning through my stuff is not the wisp of maiden's trailing gown. The meter, maybe, gallops rather rough, like river drivers storming down to town. It's more than likely something from the wood, where chalk and axes scare the deer and moose. A homely rhyme, an easy understood, an echo from the weird domain of spruce. Or else it's just some Yankee notion, dressed in rough and ready Uncle Dudley phrase. Some honest thought we common folk suggest, 
some tricksy memory flash from boyhood days. I cannot polish off this stilted rhyme with all those homely notions in my brain. A sonnet, sir, would stick me every time. Let's have a chat about common things in Maine. Home and F day. Ain't that precious? No. Well, the first thing I'd like to do is uh, about the third or fourth poem in his book, and it's uh, in the section called Round Home, and uh, it's called Sigh. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, it's called Uncle Benji and Old Crane. And let me explain it, is uh, that uh, Crane was uh, a, a lawyer, you know, and he was known for just sticking it to his uh, his uh, his uh, clients, you know, and just billing them for every single penny he could get. And Uncle Benji was pretty tricksy, you know, and he wasn't going to pay any more than he needed to. And in the scenario here that uh, they had a little uh, roundabout, and right in the center of town, right down, down in uh, where there was an audience, and one was challenged, says, well, the lawyer says, uh, if you can come up with a poem quick quick like this, then uh, I'll forego my my bill, you know, and uh, we'll see how things turned out. Because uh, right in front, he challenged them with something he didn't think he could do, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it turns out. Uncle Benji and Old Crane. Once there was a country lawyer, and his name was Hiram Crane, and he had a reputation as the worst old file in Maine. And as soon as he got the client, why, the first thing he did do was to fill the critter's pocket and then soak him cord in two. Well, sir, one day Benji Butters bought a horse, and oh, it was raw, why, old Benji, he got roasted, and he'd said he'd have the law. So he gave the case to Hiram, and then Hiram bought a suit, and got back the horse and harness and what Benji gave to boot. When he met him in the grocery, Benji asked him for the bill. And when Hiram gave him the figure, he said it was steeper than Hobson's Hill. Poor old Benji hammered and swallowed, and Bill sort of just took his breath. And then the crowd that stood a listening thought perhaps he'd choked death. But it happened that the squire felt like joking some that day, and he says, Now, Uncle Benji, there won't be a cent to pay if you'll just right here on the instant make me up a nice pat rhyme. Here you're pretty good at them things. Give me just three, give you just three minutes time. And the squire grinned like f fury, tipped the crowd a knowing wink, while Uncle Benji started in, sir, almost for you could th start to think. And this is the poem that he's coming up with. Here you see the pretty lawyer leaning on his corkscrew cane. Sartin parties call him Ganda, other people call him Crane. Though he's foul, he's sometimes doubtful what he is, my friends, but still, you can tell there's hawk about him by the gall dern critter's bell. <laughs> Crane got mad. He wanted money, but the crowd let on a roar, and they laughed the blamed old skinflit right squire out the grocery door. <laughs> so Uncle Bungie got a free ride on that one, because he lost the bet. <laughs> Ain't that precious?